Good evening, everyone. Thanks for, let me try to get this in the right spot. Thanks for braving, if, you're, if you drove in, thanks for braving the roads. And when you leave here, do drive safely, getting home. Well, thank you for being here tonight. You know, as uh, I just came in from the airport, and as I was thinking I was driving here about Whitworth and the institution, and it was many, many decades ago, and I mean many decades ago, that Whitworth administrators and faculty and staff and students independently and collectively decided to be a place that convened conversation, even on difficult topics, rather than repel against conversation, with the emphasis on the word convene. And to convene means to be together, to be face-to-face, -face, um, to be in conversation, to be in dialogue with people, to hear about their stories and their experiences and how they view the world and how they view God's work in us and in the world. And tonight is an opportunity to have one of those conversations to convene and to be in dialogue with one another. Um, you know, Whitworth has been a place where we have that, that uh, word, that important verb in our mission to equip students to honor God, follow Christ, and serve humanity. That we're in that equipping business that our responsibility and our charge and our promise is to graduate students who are equipped well to be thoughtful people, to have these kinds of conversations. And we trust when we do that well at our very, very best, Whitworth and our community does that well with conviction, with grace, with civility, and with humility. And tonight is an opportunity, we think, to do exactly that. So thanks for being here to participate and so grateful for Sally Gary and Greg Coles to be here, to come from Texas and to come from Boise to be here. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dean of Spiritual Life, Dean of Spiritual Life Forrest Buckner to make the formal introductions, but tonight is something that has come together with the uh, campus ministry, the chapel office, with the Warehouser Center, with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the President's Office to be together in this conversation. So Forrest, let me bring you forward. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, President Scott McQuilkin. As you know, I'm Forrest Buckner, Dean of Spiritual Life, and one of the campus pastors here at Whitworth. And I want to welcome you here as well on this snowy evening. So glad that you are here and you are here watching online. I want to begin by briefly sharing about our goals for this event. Two simple goals. We hope that our Whitworth community can experience tonight the reality that there can be thoughtful Christians who hold various perspectives in the LGBTQ plus discussion who can civilly interact across difference. And second, we also hope that our community members will grow in empathy ask questions, learn from other perspectives, wrestle with scripture, humbly listen, respectfully disagree, and thus be formed as humans and followers of Jesus. A couple things tonight is not. Tonight is not a debate, and there's not going to be a winner or loser tonight. And tonight is not designed to influence the hiring policy advisory committee and its deliberations. That's not what tonight's about. In short, this is an event to help us at Whitworth learn and grow how to love God better and love others better. So quick word about the format. Tonight is more of a community discussion than a formal lecture. Sally, Greg, and I have chosen a few questions that will guide our conversation for the first 45 minutes or so. But you are also invited to submit questions here in person and those of you who are online. And you can submit them anonymously by texting the number behind me. Yes, that number right there. 509-342-7238. Just text those in anonymously. They'll go to this. It's, it's no one's number in the room. It's a random Google voice text deal. No one will know who you are. And we will uh, answer those questions after the, the, the first uh, part of our time together. We'll get to as many questions as we can anyway as we do that. It's now my privilege to introduce our two speakers. Sally Gary is the executive director of Centerpiece a ministry that exists to help LGBTQ plus individuals and their families find and communities find a place to belong at Christ's table. Sally's been doing that for a lot of years. Sally holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in communication from Abilene Christian University, as well as a law degree from Texas Tech. She has coached high school and college speech and debate, 
worked as a civil trial attorney, and spent 10 years teaching communications at Abilene Christian. Originally from Wichita Falls, Texas, Sally now lives in Dallas with her wife, Karen, who's an also a, a well-respected biblical scholar, and their miniature dapple dachshund, Rudy. Sally is the author of two books, Loves God, Likes Girls, and her newest, Affirming, a memoir of faith, sexuality, and staying in the church. I'm going to get it so you can see it. Whoop. It's uh, good to see the books that, that are, have been written, and these, I'm going to recommend all of the books that, that uh, these two have written as great resources for you. Here's Sally's. You can find it on wherever you like to buy books. That's our first discussion partner. Our second discussion partner is Greg Coles. Greg is an author and rhetorician for us non-English majors. That's someone who studies how to write and speak well. Greg earned his PhD in English from Penn State University. Although he was born in New York, he grew up as a third culture kid on the island of Java, Indonesia, until he returned to the States for university at a small Christian liberal arts college a lot like Whitler. On the side, he is a church worship leader and an amateur Greek scholar. He now lives just around the corner from us in Boise, Idaho. He's an author of a number of books and academic essays, but his two popular level books are Single Gay Christian, hold it up here, and No Longer Strangers. So these are the two. Sally has an, a second book also, but I don't have it, sorry. I had the privilege today of enjoying uh, some great time with both of these two. I, I've, I've benefited a ton from reading their books. These two are excellent writers who humbly and candidly invite their readers to learn from them and with them as they have journeyed in life with God. But besides reading their books, I've also today got to know them a little bit more. They're friends. They're great people. They love Jesus. They're kind. They're fun to be with. We laughed a lot together in the couple of hours I got to have with them. They care about students. They care about your flourishing. And they really want to see all of us know and trust and love Jesus more. And I'm really grateful that we, we were to get to hear from them tonight, learn from them and with them. So will you please join me in welcoming up Sally Gary and Greg Coles. Please. I think we can just... All right. Well, here we are. Thank you again for being here. Why don't you start off, for those of us who in the room who haven't gotten to read your books, tell us a little bit about some of your story of life, faith, and sexuality. Sally, if it's okay, we'll start with you. All right. I, I am so glad to, to be here, to, to get to see the snow, if nothing else. If nothing else happens in Texas, desert planet that we are, uh, it's wonderful to get to see snow. How long do we have for it? Because I'm I'm old and there's a lot to my story. So give us give us the the, the, the Cliff's Notes version. I, I will notes. be glad to do that. Uh, I grew up in uh, a little town on the Oklahoma border. We don't always like to acknowledge that, but um, small town, church going family. Mom was an elementary teacher. Dad was an accountant. And in so many ways, my childhood was idyllic. Um, I was the quintessential good little Sunday school girl. I was the, the kid who always knew her Sunday school verse in, in Bible class, leader of the youth group. There's never been a time in my life that I didn't know who Jesus was. That's the way I grew up. I took my faith very seriously. I was the class clown. I loved making friends and befriending the underdog. And um, as I got older, I began to realize there is something different about you, Sally. Maybe it's just that you're funny. But I realized as I got older, it was more than that. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it because I grew up in the 60s and 70s when there was no talk about sexuality at all except to make really awful, awful jokes at best and deeply offensive slurs at worst. And so it didn't occur to me at all that I might be gay. Not until I was at a Christian university 
much like this one in little bitty West Texas town of Abilene, Abilene Christian University. And it was there I realized that the feelings I had for my best friend at the time went a lot deeper than friendship, that those were romantic feelings that I was experiencing and I had no idea what to do with that. I'm a good little Christian girl, remember? That can't possibly be me. All these vile things I've heard people say, that can't be me. That's not true, Sally. Well, it was. And yet I had nobody on this Christian college campus where I was learning so many good things about what it means to be a Christ follower that I didn't feel like I could share that with anybody. And so I kept it to myself for another 15 years. I was in my first year of law school when I finally was at my wit's end. I didn't think that I was going to be able to survive this. I remember writing a letter to God and coming clean with him, calling what I was feeling, what I believed was me now, what it really was, and laying it all out, being so ashamed, so afraid of someone finding that letter where I acknowledged my sexuality for the very first time, that I tore it into little bitty pieces snuck out in the dead of night from my apartment complex and put it in two different dumpsters so nobody would find it. That's the level of shame and paranoia I felt. It would be a little while later before I could finally hear God say, Sally, honey, I just want you to tell somebody I don't want you to bear this anymore by yourself. And I'm so thankful that the person that I came out to for the very first time was someone who realized that God loved me right where I was. That there was nothing about me that would ever remove his love for me. I'm so very grateful for that first moment of coming out, experiencing that. He knew I didn't need to hear Romans 1 because I knew what Romans 1 said. He knew I didn't need to hear 1 Timothy or 1 Corinthians. I knew all those passages, and I was scared to death that that meant I would be removed from the body of Christ. Thank God he was able to help me see that I was an integral part of the body of Christ and that nobody could ever remove me from that. That's just a bit of my story, but I think it's one of the most relevant ones here tonight. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you. Yes, we'll get, we'll get more of the story as we go here. Yes. Greg, let's hear from you, too, kind of faith, life, sexuality for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll start the story for you in puberty, which is a terrible time to start any story. <laughs> um, and here's what happened to me in puberty. I grew up in a, in a Christian context, which means that I grew up going to youth group. And sometimes in youth group, they would split the boys and the girls up, which invariably meant that we were going to talk about sex. <laughs> and uh, so they'd get all the boys together and they'd be like, look, boys, we know what you're all going through. Do you want to look at pictures of naked women? Just guarantee it. And I was like, gotcha. No looking at pictures of naked women. <laughs> And I discovered that I was remarkably good at not looking at pictures of naked women. Um, I was so good at it, in fact, that I started to feel like the holiest 12-year-old in the world. Because they were like, it's every man's struggle, you're all going through this. And I was like, I think I've been spared because I just love Jesus so much. Um, it took me a little while to realize that I did, in fact, have an experience of sexuality. It just wasn't the one that I was being trained for and braced for. And so really quickly, I went from feeling like the holiest 12-year-old in the world to feeling like the worst possible 12-year-old in the world, the one who was so awful that nobody had bothered to warn me that somebody like me could exist. Uh, there, were, there were really two narratives that existed in the, in the communities that I was part of for uh, somebody with an experience like mine, somebody who was gay or attracted to the same sex and wanted to be a follower of Jesus. Um, there was the, the ex-gay narrative, and there was a narrative that affirmed same-sex marriage. Um, and, and of those two narratives, the one that was more common in my community by far 
was the ex-gay narrative, which was the narrative that said, look, if you're gay, you just need to figure out what went wrong with your upbringing to make you that way, and you need to fix it. Um, so the big, the going theory at the time was like, if you're gay, it's because you had a distant father and an overbearing mother. Um, and I wish you could meet my parents this evening, but you can't. So you'll just have to take my word for it that my parents are delightful. Um, <laughs> So it seemed a little rude to like read some trauma into my childhood and be like, it's your fault, mom and dad. Um, so I was dubious of that part of the ex-gay narrative. But the other thing that they said was, look, if you're gay, you just, you pray, you trust Jesus, and as you grow in your faith, it will make you straighter. Um, and I was like, well, I was planning to pray, you know, the spiritual growth was already on the agenda, so let's go for it. Let's see what happens. Um, and I tried to measure the, the state of my spiritual growth on the basis of how straight I felt at any given time, <laughs> which caused me to do some really wild things along the way. Uh, for example, this one time, and this, by the way, is not a recommendation, not a how-to for those of you taking notes, um, but this one time I remember I ran across a picture of a scantily clad woman, and I was like, you know, I've heard that if I love Jesus, I would be straight. And I've also heard that if I were straight and I saw a picture like this, I would, like, feel things. So I took, the, I was like, I'm going for it. So I took the picture and I was like. <laughs> and you know, for all the good it did, I might as well have been staring at an office supplies poster. <laughs> but it was so deeply ingrained in me, this logic that said this and only this is how you can be a follower of Jesus. Uh, eventually I came to a point where I realized, you know, I am in fact growing in my faith. I am in fact falling more deeply in love with Jesus. And those things are not making me straighter. Um, and I reached a point of crisis where I, I felt like I need, I need to go back to the, the Bible again uh, and see, uh, see whether this thing says what I've been told that it says. Uh, and this was when I, I really grappled more, more deeply with uh, the, the same-sex marriage affirming view around Scripture. Um, and I won't go into it in great depth here. Maybe we'll get into it more in our conversation. Um, but I'll tell you three things that I discovered in brief. The first uh, was that, to my great shock, there was no biblical promise that I would be straight, which was weird to me because I was so ready for it to be in there somewhere, right? The verse that said, like, then shalt thou experience sexual attraction only for the opposite sex and never the same sex, somewhere in the book of Second Hesitations. Um, <laughs> like, I just could have sworn it was in there, and it wasn't. There, there was no biblical promise that I would be straight. There was no biblical promise that I would get married. There wasn't even, shockingly, a biblical promise that I would ever have sex. Uh... The second thing I found uh, when it came to that, that deep dive into scripture was that when it came to the question of sexual ethics and the, and the possibility of same-sex marriage for followers of Jesus, I found that that conversation was complicated. Mm -hmm. That it was a lot more complicated than many of the well-meaning people in my life made it seem when they said, look, Coles, you just flip open your Bible in the English translation, you find the word homosexual in there somewhere, it's bad. Case closed, moving on to something more pressing like the Calvinist-Arminian debate. Um, <laughs> I, I found that it was really complicated uh, and that the people who had told me that it wasn't really hadn't done me any favors. Um, and yet uh, the, the third thing I found was that though I was deeply viscerally sympathetic to arguments in favor of same-sex marriage for Christ followers, um, and though I have dear friends, present company included, um, who do find themselves landing in an affirming view, I, I couldn't get there. Um, uh, it, it didn't seem to me to be the best reading of scripture, um, and so I found myself reaching the conclusion that I feared rather than the conclusion that I wanted, um, and, and I decided, well, I guess if I don't see the possibility for a same-sex marriage for me if I follow Jesus, and I don't particularly find myself drawn to an opposite-sex marriage, uh, I suppose I will be single. Um, and when I first reached that conclusion, it, it, was, it was, you know, depressing and whatnot. Um, and I thought to myself, I think I can be okay with this, um, but the plan is that I'm just going to go to my grave, I'm going to die, and nobody is going to know that I'm gay, which obviously has worked out really well for me at this point. <laughs> um, uh, but things have, a few things have changed over the years. I've, I've become more optimistic about the beauty of singleness for followers of Jesus, mm -hmm. um, I've become more convinced that there is value in the stories that we tell, even when those stories don't seem to fit well into the world around us. Uh, and I've become more convinced that Jesus is really, really worth following, no matter how scandalous it makes you look to the people looking at you. Um, and I'm delighted to be here and have that conversation with you all. Yeah. Wow, thank you. Thank you both so much. What a great, great start.
I think we'll come back. We'll kind of come back around to some of your theological wrestlings and convictions. But let's start with a little further uh, dive in on this language because I think this trips up a lot of us. Talk to us about the language of gay Christian as opposed to same sex attracted or Christian who is gay. Or another way to frame that question is how should a, a Christian integrate other identities beyond their primary Christian identity mm -hmm. as a beloved child of God? How do those work together? Hmm. Either one of you can start. I, uh, again, I grew up at a different time when the word gay, now I'm not that old, so I'm not talking about when gay meant happy. My, my mom and dad remembered that, um, and, you know, it was the, the ruination, uh, the old Flintstones cartoon where they sing at the opening song, uh, uh, we'll have a gay old time. So I grew up with those, those cartoons, so I remember that. But by the time I was in high school, the word gay had evolved into meaning that someone was very promiscuous that it was all about rampant sexual behavior. No, I, that goes against everything I believe as a Christ follower. Of course, that's, that I can't be gay because that's what that word meant. Connotations that are, that have been troublesome for me just because of what I grew up hearing about someone who was a lesbian. That was not something I heard a lot, and when I did, that was bad. So, opens a door for conversation, then that is the truth about me. Um, but the word itself has a different connotation for me. I'm more apt to tell you that I'm gay because now what that word means to me is that my sexual orientation is different. I am more naturally drawn to women than to men. And so I am gay in that sense. Um, do I lead always with, hi, I'm Sally and I'm gay? No, I don't. Uh, hi, I'm Sally and I'm a gay Christian? Uh, no. I don't, nor do I tell you, uh, hi, I'm Sally, and I'm Dan and Betty's daughter. All three of those are equally true. Uh, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a lawyer. I'm a nonprofit director. Uh, those are all true things about me, too. Um, none of those things take away from the fact that first and foremost at the very core of my being, I am an image bearer of God. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And that is the most important thing that you could ever know about me and hopefully you will come to know that more by the ways I interact with you, and the ways I respond and treat you than anything I could say about me. I am so very proud to be Dan and Betty's daughter. I'm so very proud to be Thelma and Andy's granddaughter. It doesn't become more important, but I would certainly hope that you would not ask me to deny the truth that I am Thelma and Andy's granddaughter because it seemed like I was putting that ahead of being a Christ follower. any more than me simply telling you something a little bit more about myself, which is that I am gay. And that might uh, have some meaning for the ways in which you interact with me. It might not, uh, to the extent that it becomes relevant in our relationship. Uh, I, I don't want to have to refrain from using that as a descriptor of Sally. Yeah, let me, let me add two, two comments to that. One is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the term same-sex attracted, which I think mm. in many parts of uh, evangelical Christendom at any rate, um, there tends to be a preference for the term same-sex attracted, like, oh, if you call yourself gay, then that will mean that your sexual identity is too important to you. But if you call yourself same-sex attracted, that's sort of the safe option. Mm. Um, I think it's worth noting that all of our linguistic options come with some kind of baggage 
uh, historically. And same-sex attracted uh, carries a particular kind of baggage because of its historic connection to the ex-gay movement. Mm. Um, so so the, the phrase was popularized because uh, as the ex-gay movement was starting to realize uh, in, in kind of the, the 80s and 90s uh, that their goal of turning people straight wasn't precisely working in the sense that people were no longer attracted to the same sex, um, what they did is they sort of moved the goalposts and said, oh, instead of, instead of getting people to actually be straight, we'll just get them to stop identifying as gay. Um, and so they encourage people to, uh, to, for instance, stand in front of a mirror and say things like, I am God's heterosexual son, I am God's heterosexual daughter, right? Kind of like a name it and claim it, like you are what you call yourself. And so same-sex attracted was a term that you could use to speak about your attraction as if it was ephemeral, fleeting, as if it was like a foot cramp, you know, like go away with a couple weeks treatment. Um, uh, and, and so because of the term's historic association then with the ex-gay movement, I think there are many of us, myself included, who would have some concern about aligning ourselves with that term. Um, uh, but speaking more broadly to sort of the power of language to define us and to determine what is important about us, uh, it seems to me that attributive adjectives in the English language um, almost always have the power to transform the nature of the noun if we want them to. Um, but they don't necessarily carry that power. Let me give you an example so that this is not too abstract and, you know, college professory. Um, uh, take, for instance, the phrase American Christian. Um, I would propose to you that there are at least two wildly different ways in which to be an American Christian. Uh, one is to say, I am a Christian, and therefore it is important to me to bring all aspects of my experience of the world under the lordship of Jesus. And that includes the fact that I am a citizen of the United States of America. And I recognize that there are certain kinds of sins that are easily available to me as a follower of Jesus who lives in the United States of America. And I recognize that there are certain opportunities that I have in this place that I want to, uh, I want to seize as a follower of Jesus. Um, and so it seems to me in that way, it's a really good and important thing to name the fact that our Christianness exists in the United States. Um, However, I have also encountered another breed of American Christian, um, and it is the sort of American Christian for whom their Americanness becomes a kind of filter through which their Christianity is processed, and somehow becomes a license to think that America being number one in the world and American national interests being pursued at the expense of every other nation in the world is somehow like a priority of Jesus, which just strikes me as wildly unbiblical. Um, and so in that sense, um, I would be really cautious of the American Christian if that's what they mean um, by their Americanness. Um, and, and so I suppose I would want to posit to you that sexual identity is like pretty much every other aspect of human experience in the sense that it has the capacity to outstrip our obedience to Jesus, not by virtue of being sexual identity, but simply by virtue of the human capacity for idolatry in all things. Um, and I think that's true for you regardless of your experience of sexuality this evening. Uh, it is perfectly possible for you to make your heterosexuality, if you identify as straight, to make your heterosexuality the lens through which you process your pursuit of Jesus. Um, and so if you're doing that, repent, sinner, but in love. <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. Well, and, and on a very, just a very simplistic explanation, which is, I, I think, part of what Greg's getting at is, is that gay Christian, I mean, and English professor here, it's just an adjective. It is, in fact, an adjective. It, I can confirm. It's just, it's just an adjective. <laughs> so it's not in any way taking away from the centrality of our Christian walk, our Christian identity. It's just... Uh, it's just a, an adjective. That sounds like a book title. It's just an adjective. Yeah. Okay, so this one, Greg, you start this one. So on page 139 of Affirming, Sally, you say, quote, our sexual orientation determines far more about us than our sexual behavior. It is a fundamental aspect of how we are drawn to and relate to others. I think this builds on what you're saying. This is part of who you are. Yeah. So will you t tell us, Greg, first, elaborate on that. What, is that? what does that mean? When you hear that, what does that mean for you? I would love to tell you what Sally meant when she wrote that, <laughs> which is as follows. Um, you, when, I, when I think about the way in which sexual identity speaks to more than just sort of the bare experience of sexual attraction, a couple things come to mind. 
Uh, one is, uh, I think a lot of our modes of human relating come into being as we are, uh, as we are mature, maturing through puberty and into adulthood. Um, and the experience of sexual attraction informs some of how we figure out that relating space. Um, and so that means that some of what we figure out downstream of our figuring out can still be true apart from the experience of attraction. Uh, so for instance, um, I had loads and loads of female friends uh, mm. when I was young and it felt very comfortable to me uh, because I was really in some ways sort of scared of men. Um, uh, and, and that continues to be true of me. Um, and and is, is unrelated to my sexuality per se. I just really delight in being friends with women, which I love. Um, and I don't think you have to be gay to love being friends with women. Um, there are also things that are just statistically true. For instance, um, the number of gay men I know who play the piano is just outrageous. Like, <laughs> and I played the piano, by the way. Um, just, just not like I needed to tell you that. You knew. Um, <laughs> But the number of times that I've gone to a church and they're, they're like, so we had a question we wanted to ask you about our worship team. And I just want to be like, let me save you some time. The piano player's gay. Because the piano player's always gay. Um, uh, that, again, this is, not, this is not universally true. But it is, there, there are just things that, that tend to be statistically true uh, about certain, certain experiences of, of sexuality. Uh, right, this is, this is why stereotypes exist at, at times, not because they're universally true, but because they do tend to document some real pattern that exists in the world. Um, now, what is it about gay men that makes us so darn good at the piano? I'm not sure. I think if I attempted to put words to it, I would probably succeed in making some wildly indefensible scientific claims along the way. Um, but it does seem observationally true to me. Um, one last thought, and, and then I'll let Sally give an actually good answer to this question. Um, but my, my final thought is this, um, that I think especially, especially when I'm talking to uh, uh, Christian folks who are coming from the, from the traditional side of the conversation, um, uh, there, can, there can be a, a tendency for them to, to hear a story like mine and to want to process my experience as being entirely about like, oh, here's like this experience of sexual attraction or sexual temptation that, that, that you're saying no to. Um, and they sort of leave out the fact that when I say that I'm gay, I'm also saying like, you could drop me in a room full of naked women and the only thought that would cross my mind is like, look at my dearly loved sisters in the Lord, right? Like I, I experience absolutely no temptation to lust in a situation like that, which is a thing that very few of my straight brothers in the Lord can claim. Um, and so honestly, when I call myself gay, maybe what I'm doing is just bragging about how easy it is for me to not lust after women. Um, uh, and, and that, it seems to me, is also part of the shaping of, of the experience that I bring to the world. Um, those were some wildly diffuse thoughts. Sally, bring it together for us. <laughs> but that was, that was so lovely, Greg. The, 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 whole, the whole diatribe on, on piano playing gay men, yes, yes. Yes, I love that. I, you know, I think. <laughs> when you want to read the question again, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm thinking of a an interview I did once about my my first book, in which the interviewer started telling, on page such and such, you wrote such and such and such and such, and you told about this story and blah blah blah. And I'm thinking, that story, I, that doesn't sound familiar. Oh, did I write that? And I'm thinking, I, I, I don't remember always. Do you have that happen, Greg, that somebody will ask you about something that you've written and you think, did I write that? Where did I write that story? But literally, it was, a, it was a story from another book. He had the wrong book, and he was talking about a story that I was not, and I thought, oh, phew. Uh, I was, I was uh, glad that I hadn't just completely forgotten. But I, I, I'm thinking... That, that sentence comes out of, of the context of how so, so many folks are quick to, uh, to just think about sexuality in terms of sexual behavior. Mm. That being gay, uh, talking about LGBTQ plus people at all is just all about the way we have sex. 
It's all about what happens in the bedroom, uh, what happens uh, among two people who are attracted to each other sexually, and that that's all it is. And so it just misses the, the whole dynamic of sexual orientation, which to me it means that I am drawn to women in a way that, that is very different from the ways in which I'm drawn to men. And some people think, oh, well, you just hate men. No, that, that, quite the contrary. Uh, I would venture to say that my dearest, closest friends uh, to this day are men. Uh, my pastor has long been my dearest friend and, and confidant. Uh, I have many friends uh, to which I am close, uh, to, which, uh, to whom I confide, uh, who are men. But when it comes to um, a romantic relationship, uh, the companionship that I believe God calls us to for life uh, in covenant, that has always been for me more naturally, I, I'm more naturally drawn to a woman for that type of relationship. So that's kind of what I meant. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that I notice ar arise in both of your books is how fear, shame, and secrecy, fear, shame, and secrecy commonly <clears throat> describe the experience of gay people, maybe especially gay Christians. Can you expand on this and help us see how Jesus and his rad radical hospitality has met you in your journey of fear, or through fear, shame, and secrecy? If you had told younger Sally that one day all I would want to do is go around the globe, literally, and talk about the fact that I'm gay, I, she would have she would have absolutely swallowed her tongue. Uh, it, it would have been absolutely terrifying to her because I was committed to keeping this secret for my life. I was never going to tell a soul. And the energy that that took, the energy I expended to keep this part of myself a secret, Oh, what I would give to have that energy back now. Some of you may know what I mean about the energy it takes to keep secrets. I kept all kinds of secrets. Secrets about the things that happened in my family, the things my father said and did, the ways that my family did not function as a family was intended to function. I kept all of that a secret. And so I was well versed in secrecy long before I discovered that I was gay. And now I had another secret. And it was like living like this on eggshells lots of the time. But on the outside, you see this family that looks like we have it all together. We're in the pews every Sunday. We're the family you can count on. But on the inside, there's a secret we never tell. And Sally never tells a soul that she's gay. I cannot, uh, and I still probably, we, we may never know what that did to me physically, mentally, emotionally, to have to carry that all by myself for 35 years of my life. What I would have given to be able to sit in this room when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old and hear a woman say, yeah, she came to jail, she was a Christian, Sally. It would have changed my life. I would have saved all that energy, all that pain uh, that comes from fear and shame and secrecy. Yes, to all that. Also, um, there there are two there are two consequences that I think uh, living living in fear and shame have 
for our own understanding of our belovedness. Uh, one is, uh, Scripture says that uh, perfect love casts out fear, um, which suggests that the, the places that, that fear has the power to accrue are places in which our, our capacity to experience perfect love is in some way impeded. Um, uh, it seems to me that the, the posture of fear, it almost uh, deadens our, our receptors to our understanding of our belovedness. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, I, I know that my own experience of, of being in the closet, uh, which was, I, I, think it, I think it is possible to, to be in the, uh, to, to not be super open about your experience of sexuality for reasons other than just fear and shame, um, but in my case, those things were deeply wedded with one another. Um, and uh, while I was in the closet, uh, it was really, really difficult for me to believe that I was loved by God or by anyone else fully because all the love that I heard seemed to come with an asterisk. Um, because I could always ask, well, yeah, th they say they love me, but the person they love is kind of like my effigy. Um, and I don't actually know if this person would love me if they knew all the parts of me. Um, and, and to be, in that sense, dead into receiving love from other people makes it difficult for us to understand the love that God has for us um, because uh, when, when God creates human beings in his image, right, as, as the, the imago dei, um, that means that human beings are the, the most concrete way in which we see God. Uh, human beings are like God's, uh, God's uh, representatives on earth, and, and the way that we see the divine is by seeing it reflected on the faces of the people around us. Um, and so insofar as we're not able to understand that love, uh, it becomes that much more difficult for us to understand the, the, the unconditional love of God. Uh, and, and so for me, the, the, the process of being known was also a process of learning to understand uh, in a way that was not just cognitive, but began to be more experiential, uh, to understand the, the depth of God's mm -hmm. love for me. Um, and so in that sense, uh, lo love, I think, was both, uh, both the antidote to and the outcome of uh, the, the disappearance of shame through the process of being known. Thank you, Mary. So let's build on that, and how can the church better make space for gay people in our midst to know that love and receive that love? What, and what is the church missing out on when it doesn't make space for gay people in our midst? Hmm. And I know Sal, you, this is what your ministry is all about, helping yeah. this happen. So oh, I yeah. know you have a lot to share in both of you. Yeah, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, this, we have, this is... There's one more question after this, and then we're going to go to your question. So if you want to be texting, you have permission to text your, those questions in as well. Goodness. We, we do whole seminars, and we have a, a five-month exploration of faith and sexuality that we do for church leaders and pastors to explore this, this very thing about how uh, churches can be— can become more inclusive of LGBTQ people and, and fully embrace us, um, these spaces where we can utilize our gifts that were given to us by God. I think, you know, what you're doing here tonight, this conversation, having spaces like this to converse, to talk, uh, to bring in the open the fact that there are differing perspectives, different interpretations of, of scripture, and yet here we are talking uh, together because there's far more in common that Greg and I share about our theology, about our beliefs, about what it means to be a Christ follower than our views of same-sex marriage. Um, to acknowledge that and and to push forward, I think it's going to have to be a very intentional. Uh, we are going to talk about this because there is no fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. And, and we're going to, as scary as this is, we're going to have this conversation. And we're going to talk and, and figure out and 
to uh, follow Jesus' plea for, for unity that he shares with the disciples the night before he, he dies. Look at, at those last few chapters of the Gospel of John and, and soak that in about how we can stay together and how we can think differently about things, but it doesn't have to remove us. I think our fear, my fear was always, if you know me fully, if, if I say this, this thing about myself, then you will have to separate yourself from me. If we can get past that uh, discipleship, how does this impact me as a Christ follower? So I had to study it for someone for whom it's not their life, or the lives of their children, or and sometimes even with parents I know, it's not something that they've been willing to really grapple with, to say, I'm going to read, I'm going to learn everything that I possibly can about this. Um, I think when you begin to, to be willing to do that, it changes everything. When, when you get to, to know us and have these conversations and you realize, huh, not everything that I was taught, not everything I grew up believing about this is necessarily true. Uh, what, what more do you have for me, God, to learn about this? Um, I, Thank you, Brad. Yeah. That's perfect. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, speaking to the, some of the things that I think we, we miss as the, as the body of Christ writ large if we miss out on uh, our, our LGBTQ. A lot of LGBTQ folks seem to have a kind of genius for community mm. that I think can be really missing from, uh, I'll, I'll speak at least to the white evangelical tradition since that's kind of my own, so I feel like I have the most right to own it for its warts and all. Um, I don't think white evangelicals as a rule are great at community. Um, I think we've gotten really great at teaching people to sequester into their nuclear family bubbles and expect that those will be the places in which their sense of belonging and their, mm -hmm. their locus of community is found. Um, and uh, almost all of the LGBTQ folks I know um, bring, I think, a, a kind of wisdom in human community uh, that, that's really valuable to church spaces that, that behave in that way. Um, the the uh, LGBTQ community writ large, if you're not familiar with it, has, has a concept uh, of chosen family, mm. um, uh, largely developed uh, from people who get kicked out of their, uh, their biological or nuclear family homes um, after coming out. Um, and so uh, there's, there's been a, a practice of uh, LGBTQ folks kind of coming around that person and saying like, we are your family now, like we, we are going to provide space for you to live, we're going to provide the support that you need. Um, uh, there's, the, Jesus is, is, is uh, teaching and uh, his mother and brothers show up um, and, and the disciples are like, yo, Jesus, your mother and brothers are here. And Jesus says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he points to his followers and he's like, these are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and sister and brother. And so Jesus actually sort of redefines family, redefines the question of to whom our primary allegiance is owed, with whom we find our primary sense of belonging, and says that, that familial identity is fundamentally meant to be found within the body of Christ. Um, and so I think there's, there's something that we lose if we miss that. Um, that, I think, is a... Um, uh, I won't say especially, but I will say differently true, perhaps, um, for uh, LGBTQ folks like myself um, who find ourselves called to celibacy. Um, because when you're celibate, um, among other things, you don't get married and have 2.3 children and a white picket fence and live happily ever after. Um, I know this comes as a shock to you. Some of you were imagining a celibacy with marriage. Um, uh, but if you don't have those things, and yet if you've spent your whole life being told that that is the place in which you find family, that is the place in which you find community, it requires you to radically rethink some of the things you thought were true about the experience of community and the experience of belonging. Um, and I, I know some LGBTQ folks who are just doing gloriously wild and countercultural things in building family with one another. Um, that when I see them look so much more like the church of the first century, than a lot of what I see modeled around me in 21st century America. And it seems to me that there's, there's a gift that we stand to gain um, by, by seeing the way that the spirit is at work within that community. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you.
Okay, my, my last question, then we'll go to, to the, the audience questions. I know that we, uh, we're not here to debate, but I think it is helpful for us to just to hear a little bit more about how you landed on your theological convictions regarding same-sex marriage and how, how you see that. So I, I know that could be, when there are books, and your books and many others that have, that unpack all those different verses and all those things, but I wonder for you if you could just explain maybe, maybe one or two, maybe yeah, one or two of those like key kind of theological rocks that kind of found that, form that foundation for you, and maybe experiential and theological rocks that, that form that foundation for you, and then also um, maybe just helping us, helping us see uh, how, how it is that you, you see the scripture in that way, and also what is one resource if people want to wrestle on their own, like what's one resource you'd say, okay, definitely read this mm. if you want to dive into this further. Maybe start this one. Yeah. Um, in terms of my own journey, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, first of all, um, I, I mentioned that I, I think the conversation is really complicated. Um, and for me, a lot of where I found that complexity was uh, in, in what are sometimes called the clobber passages. Um, uh, right. So uh, 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 you've got the two Leviticus passages and then you've got uh, Romans one and first Corinthians six and first uh, uh, Timothy one. Uh, some people will throw uh, Genesis 19, the Sodom story in there, which is, feels to me wildly silly because of all the things I have been drawn to do sexually in my life, gang raping angels has never been on the list. Um, uh, but just generally, I'll say, um, I'm sorry, some of you didn't have gang raping angels on your bingo card of things I would say this evening. Um, just generally, I would say the, the, the clobber passages are, uh, they're, they're, they're more complicated uh, than, than they may seem at face value. Um, uh, so uh, those were not particularly persuasive for me. Um, and in fact, uh, once I'd studied them quite a bit, I almost got to the point of being like, I wonder if the Bible is just entirely silent about my experience. Um, and it was, in the end, it was actually uh, the unacceptability of that thought in my mind the idea that this Jesus who's so radically eager to speak to people on all kinds of margins somehow seemed to like entirely forget that I would exist. Um, I, I just couldn't abide by that. It didn't seem to accord with the, with the Jesus that I saw in scripture. Um, and, and so I think when I, when I stopped asking the question, how can I get myself out of the text of scripture? And started to instead ask, like, if Jesus was purposeful in speaking to me, then where do I see myself reflected within the text of Scripture? Um, that was where uh, that was where things like recognizing what seems to be uh, the the definition of marriage as from the very beginning, from the book of Genesis, as uh, un being understood within the context of male and female differentiation seem to make more sense. The ways in which Jesus invokes uh, the word porneia, which is the Greek word for sexual immorality, um, which uh, same-sex sexual activity. Um, and it seemed to me like, would Jesus have used that word knowing that his listeners would think, oh yeah, this includes same-sex sexual activity, and then just be like, oh, whoops, sorry guys, not, didn't mean to. Um, it, it made more sense to me, it, it accorded more with the person of Jesus to say, I think, I think he really was intentional. I think that is a place where Jesus intends to speak directly uh, to, to me. Um, uh, there, there's more that could be said. I've, I've rambled on long enough. Uh, and again, as I said, I, I, think it's, I think it's complicated, and I think people yeah. of mutual goodwill, deeply seeking to follow Jesus, can, can reach different conclusions. Um, uh, as, as, to, as to resources on the subject, um, uh, whew, the, uh, probably the, the book that I personally found most helpful at the theological level uh, was the book People to be Loved by Press and Sprinkle. Um, though uh, I, I, can't think of, I can't think of a single, there, there are things about that book that I love and things about that book that I'm like, meh. Um, uh, don't tell Preston I said so, I work with him. Um, uh, uh, I, yeah, um, read, read a lot. Uh, don't, don't just read one side to be convinced by one side. Read, read all the sides. Um, uh, M Matthew Vine's book, I think, is, is wonderful and thoughtful. Uh, we were talking about James Brownson's book, which is a real slog in the sense that he's very academic, but it's incredibly thoughtful. Uh, Karen Keene, uh, who is Sally's wife, Karen Keene's books, uh, Scripture, Ethics, and the Possibility of Same-Sex Relationship, is, I think, uh, by far, in my opinion, the most persuasive book in defense of 
uh, same-sex marriage for followers of Jesus. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think Karen is a fabulous thinker. Um, I would love to be fully convinced by Karen's argument. I'm not, but you should read it because it's really, really thoughtful. <laughs> Oh, Greg, she will be thrilled that you, that you endorsed her book before I had to. <laughs> Which, of course, I would have. As you but should, yeah. Yes, yes, that's really kind of you to say. And, you know, I, as I've said many times to you, I spent the vast majority of my life exactly where you are, uh, convicted of um, my uh, belief that to be pleasing to God, I needed to live a, a life of aloneness and, and celibacy. And yet I too was a, a huge proponent, still am, of the church becoming family, family and community and connection for people who are single. We don't know what to do with somebody who's heterosexual and single. Um, I, I have such great respect uh, for where you are and who you are and that, um, that will always be I will always fight I will always contend for your conviction uh, to live the life that you are living no one will ever discount that in front of me the process of becoming affirming for me was indeed a process. And in fact, uh, that's what my book, Affirming, is all about. Um, my mom passed away before I got to a place of, of being able to, to come out and articulate why I believe that God was uh, honoring of same-sex marriage. And so, I, Plus, she was in her 90s. She was 92 when she passed away. And I would, I would have given anything to have been able to have this conversation with my mom when she was about 50, 55 in her prime. And I knew that my mom would have been the one to say, Sally, uh, explain to me how you got there. Show me, show me in the Bible how you reach that conclusion because what I read is very, very different. It would have been most important to my mother. And so it was extremely important to me that I be able to explain. Now, I'm not the biblical scholar in our family. Uh, my wife, Karen, is the biblical scholar extraordinaire. She's just scary smart. Uh, and she, she wrote her first book on this topic um, as a way of dealing with her own process of becoming affirming. So, Scripture, Ethics, and the Possibility of Same-Sex Relationships by Karen Keen, K-E-E-N, is the book that I would recommend to you to read if you are wanting to really dive into Scripture. And, and much more than just the, the passages that, that Greg mentioned, which are the traditional passages. It would take too long for me to sit here and explain to you how I got to that place. My book is not any kind of exegetical work. It is a book of stories. Trust me. There's exegetical and theological underpinnings of every single one of those stories because I, I began to realize that throughout my life, over time, I have come to see so many things differently. You know, I, I grew up in a tradition where I was taught that you couldn't dance. Anybody else come from a tradition like that? Oh, my goodness, I still see hands. That Yes, and, and yet... I, I don't believe that at all now, but there was a time in my life that when the Sunday school class on was debating whether dancing was a sin or not, I was the kid you could get to say, yes, it's a sin. I was that kid. I don't think that anymore. And so I began to realize that there were other things that I had come to a different place on. Um, one of the, the big 
turning points for me uh, was a conversation I had with a friend who is a Bible professor. Uh, we were teaching together at Abilene Christian, and, and just in conversation, he began to show me the different translations of the word used in 1 Corinthians 6, and, and I was just blown away um, at how uh, different words had been used down through the centuries. Twelve pages, he showed me, of the different type, front top to bottom. It was a bunch, and I thought, oh, my word, if this word has been translated differently, how, uh, what does that mean for other, it just really shook me. And so I began to explore that more. Um, learning from different preachers in my tradition that scripture is to be viewed holistically rather than to pick out uh, passages like I had been taught to proof texts um, and to apply the overarching message of scripture and then when I look at the very first crack out of the box and God says it is not good for a man to be alone and I remember having a conversation I write about this in the book a conversation with another Bible professor friend of mine who is not affirming uh, and even after many, many conversations, he, he is still not affirming, and I love him dearly. But I, I said to him, if, if Genesis 1 through 3 is the overarching passage that tells us about gender and sexuality and marriage, and, and this is what we're to uh, follow and let guide us, what, what about this little line in Genesis 2 that says it's not good for us to be alone? What do we do with that? What do I do with that? Well, I think in part it is church that provides connection, but the context in which God says it's not good for me to be alone is within a relationship between two people who are forming a kinship. I've come to understand that meaning of kinship and forming a bond, a covenant for life that is faithful. You see, in no way do I believe that there is such openness to sexuality. I am committed to Karen for the rest of my life without question. Without question. That's my sexual ethic. It's the sexual ethic that the church taught me and that I find in scripture and that I live by to this day. I look at Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, how church leaders gathered and looked at the whole concept of allowing Gentiles to be a part of the body of Christ. It was unheard of. The old law said, no, absolutely not. They came to look at that differently. Paul, being their biggest proponent, Paul was radical. You go back and you look at some of those letters. We've done Paul a disservice sometimes because Paul was talking about inclusion that was radical. The treatment of women I grew up thinking Paul disliked women. Go back and look at Ephesians and really give it some time. There's so much more we could say about all of this. Um, but if you want to know really and truly how I got where I am, read Affirming. It'll probably confuse you more. but <laughs> We'll get the story. Thank yeah. you, Sally. Thank you, Greg. Lauren Taylor, our pastor for discipleship, is going to going to give us a question that's for starts off with a question from the crowd and uh, just a few minutes and so um, I'll try I do my best to pick out the most common ones first question uh, do you ever get tired of good Christians quote wrestling with your identity or existing 
as a challenge or a learning experience for others. Mm. Mm. You've been doing it longer than I have. Repeat the first part of that question again. Do you ever get tired of? Do you ever get tired of Christians wrestling with your identity? Mm. Of you being the learning experience for the rest of us? Does that get exhausting for you? <laughs> and then what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> of course, in, in my humanness, there are always those times. I had the beauty of a mom and dad that I was able to wrestle through a, a lot of this with at first, and yet um, I, I remember one conversation, we were in the car, and, and my parents, my dad was driving, I was in the back seat, <laughs> and, and my mom was asking me questions, and it was a difficult conversation. Uh, it, it, they were so full of questions because they didn't have anybody to ask either. And I remember through tears saying, not only do I have to be going through this myself, but I've got to explain everything to you. I've got to teach you. And my mom in her sweetness said, I know, honey, I know. And I, I am so sorry for that. And I think that um, acknowledgement uh, has done a lot for me to give me a, a safe foundation to then be able to be patient with others. Um, because you have to have a place where you ask those questions. You have to have somebody initially who is that poster child, if you will, that can help you understand uh, and come to a better place. Does that get tiring? for Greg and me, I, I won't speak for Greg, I'll let him answer on his own, but uh, it, it certainly, it certainly can, and so it requires retreat sometimes, and self-care, and taking care of, of yourself, so that, that you can go back into that arena, and, and receive people uh, with love, and grace, and understanding that we all need that place at times. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, yes, I agree. It gets tiring. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, people, people need to practice, I think, on somebody. Uh, I know lots of straight people who just need a lot of practice at, like, interacting with gay people. And I love that they get to practice on me. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I think part of the reason I'm able to to do it to the degree that I am is that I've had a remarkably non-traumatic experience in so many ways. Um, like my family relationships are great. All of them. I have like an entirely evangelical family and all my family relationships are great. You know how many gay Christians I know who can say that about their evangelical families? Remarkably few. Um, so um, so because, because I have some of the support and haven't had some of the, some of the same trauma that other folks have had, um, I think I have a bit more capacity, and yet, still, mm -hmm. retreat is necessary. Um, and, and identifying, uh, uh, knowing, knowing who are, who are uh, safe voices that you can, that you can look to uh, and speak to, which is a skill that more of us, I think, should develop in more of our lives, to not just sort of throw open our lives to the world and be like, hey, everybody vote on the state of my spiritual life. How am I doing? Let me just take a survey. Um, uh, which is the way that I tended to live my life before I came out, because before I came out, the survey results were amazing. Like, everybody was like, oh, Greg seems to be doing really great with Jesus. And I was like, cool, bring on the survey. And then I came out, and suddenly the survey results were much more. <laughs> and, and it became necessary for me, who do I trust? Like, who, when they tell me I'm doing great, is actually speaking a reflection that I think reflects the Jesus of the Bible? Um, and, and who doesn't? Um, and I think the, the more I know whose voice is worth trusting, the more able I am to have conversations with people whose voices I think are not worth trusting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Give us another one, Lauren. I know we'll have to kind of keep blazing through them, so. Yep. Um, okay. How about, um, Greg, there were a number of questions actually about um, how, as someone who, who is a celibate gay Christian, how do you do that well? Um, and uh, yeah, there were a lot of questions that had to do with that. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, mm, there's, there's so much that could go into that. Well, number one, how do I do it well? I don't know that I do all the time. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, please don't think that because I'm sitting at the front of the room, I'm somehow some resplendent model of how the thing should be done. Um, I'm muddling along with Jesus, um, tr- trying, trying to be faithful, at times failing to be faithful, believing that Jesus is, is big enough to love me through it all. Um, uh, I, I think, I think for me, a big part of the, the challenge of the experience of celibacy has been feeling like the, the models that I'm aware of for how a life with Jesus can be flourishing don't seem to exist for somebody like me. Um, uh, you, you don't, you don't hear a lot of like, oh yeah, here are all the celibate gay stories. Here are all the celibate gay people in your life who you can look at and be like, oh, you're what I could look like at 40 years old and 50 years old and 75 years old. Um, you just don't see a ton. Um, and, and so I think uh, it, it requires a, a, bit of, a bit of imagination to ask, um, are there ways that the life Jesus wants to dream for me might not fit into the models of flourishing that I see most commonly around me? Um, and part of, me, part of me hates asking that question, and part of me loves asking that question because I feel like it's an invitation to not simply fall into the patterns of behavior that seem common. Um, and I think perhaps far too many of us in our exercise of Christian faith uh, fall into the temptation of thinking that our Christianity can simply be a falling into the pattern of what we see lived around us. Um, uh, a, a note about uh, uh, just the idea of aloneness. Um, it seems to me that if celibacy is, is fundamentally synonymous with aloneness or with isolation or with a lack of intimacy, then like celibacy is the worst. Um, uh, and and I, don't, I don't think that it is, or I don't think that it has to be. Um, I think that it can be. Uh, and yet I also know some married people who are really, really alone. So number one, I don't think we should think of marriage as like the solution to loneliness. The number of people I know who are like, look, here's the thing. I got married and somebody told me like my spouse would solve all my relational needs. And like <laughs> now we're having a problem because I have no other friends. Um, and I feel so bad for them because I'm like the great news for me is I never stopped having friends because I knew that I needed them. Um, it's ironic that we read the Bible now and we think that the best and truest form of human love is marital love. Um, because what Jesus has to say on the subject uh, in, in John chapter 15, uh, chapter 13, 13, 15, 15, 13, I don't know, I like to think I quote the Bible like Jesus. It is written in there someplace. Um, uh, but somewhere in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, uh, that they lay down their life for their friends. Not greater love has no one than this, that they you know, find a spouse and 2.3 children. Um, uh, yeah, the, the fact that we read 1 Corinthians 13 at our wedding ceremonies as if it's like, oh, love is patient, love is kind, and like, this is what love is, this is where all the love, patience, and kindness happen. Like, here's, here's what I want evangelicals to do. I want us to read 1 Corinthians 7 at our wedding ceremonies, right? <laughs> the single man is concerned with the things of the Lord, but the married man is concerned with the things of the world, how to please his wife. The single woman is concerned with the things of the Lord. She's devoted to the Lord in both body and mind, but the married woman is concerned with the things of the world and how to please her husband, so her interests are divided. So then, the ones who marry, they do okay, but the one who does not marry does better. <laughs> right, like, put that in your wedding pipe and smoke it. Um, no, and, and, and please, please don't hear me denigrating the vocation of marriage, which I think is a beautiful thing. It just seems to me that maybe we need to reclaim a bit of the beauty of singleness along the way. Um, and that maybe if we recognize the beauty of singleness, maybe if we recognize the value that exists within that vocation, we wouldn't be funneling so many people into marriage because we think that that's the solution to all our problems, but we would instead be trying to more creatively imagine how all of us can exist in beautiful, flourishing, and intimate community together. Oh, yeah. You know, I, 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 I know that was your question, Greg. But you should answer too, Sally. Well, <laughs> simply because I, I didn't get married until I was 59 years old. Yeah, see, you didn't believe me, but I am that old. <laughs> 59. I, I spent 59 years as a single gay Christian. You should write that. Oh, you did. <laughs> It was only uh, by community uh, mm. with, within church mm. uh, 
uh, and, and there were places that I lived and was a part that I felt that profoundly, and there were places that I felt very much alone and, and isolated. Uh, did my life flourish during those 40 years? Of course. Of course, God allowed me to uh, participate in all kinds of, of good things in my life. Um, as I look back on that time, do I recognize, oh, profound times of, of, of loneliness in the midst of that? Yes. Uh, but with the complete conviction and sincere devotion to that being what I was called to by God. And so no regrets on that whatsoever. Um, you can do that. I did do that. You're doing that. Yeah. Last question. Uh, there, Whitworth has always kind of uniquely been a place where differences of opinion can exist together. Um, and that's something I feel proud about, who we are. Yeah. Can you give us any advice Seeing your friendship model tonight has been so helpful on how people with different opinions can still form some meaningful community or friendship or relationship. You know, one thing I value about Greg is that we can simply have this conversation. Uh, I, I remember uh, the conversation we had over pancakes for breakfast at our home uh, back in October, just simply saying, okay, so what, what is fearful about this conversation uh, for, for you? And, and just being able to ask those questions that everybody kind of tippy toes around and, and doesn't want to ask. I have come to learn from Greg that I can ask those questions. And, and that's not going to change anything between us. Um, we haven't known each other that long, but I, 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 just, I just believe that, that that's not going to change. And so that safety and security, I think, has been, I don't know, I, I think that is the spirit at work in you and in me that I, re I recognize that in you. Mm. Yeah. Love you. I love you too. Sorry, we're having a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think so, sometimes, sometimes we'll ask questions about like, is this issue an agree to disagree issue? Um, and I've always thought that that was a bit of a specious question. Uh, because it seems to assume that I have some power to decide whether or not people can disagree with me, which things they're allowed to disagree on, which disagreements are okay to have and which ones are not. And it seems to me the reality is like people do disagree with me. Um, and so the question I get to answer is not, is, is Sally allowed to disagree with me? The question is like, what are Sally and I called to do in the midst of our disagreement? Like, what does it look like to encourage one another in the direction of Jesus even in ways that we don't see eye to eye. Um, if I always put myself in the position of responsibility of saying, it's my job to determine whether or not you are right with Jesus and I have drawn the boundary lines correctly, um, I worry that I have put myself a bit too much in the shoes of Jesus. Um, and I would, I would rather not do that. I would rather have the, have the epistemic humility of saying, there are a number of things I have been wrong about in life and I trust there will be a number more uh, when I get to heaven and they send out the theology quiz, I will not get above a 70%. Um, and yet I can, as a person of deep conviction, say these, these are the things I hold to be true, and yet I also deeply love people who hold them differently. And it is not my job to sort out on behalf of God how it all works. Um, I don't need to know how it all works in order to be someone who lives like a disciple of Jesus and someone who loves well. 
Jesus himself said the most important thing is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus. If we're intent on doing that, then we don't have to fix all these other things that we think we need to fix. May not need mm. fixing at all. Mm, that's good. Thank you both. I want one more, one final question, I think, for us. Could you give us just a one or two sentence word of encouragement for us at Whitworth? What would you encourage us or exhort us into as you, as you uh, send us off uh, from this wonderful visit with us? Well, I think what I just said is, is a good place to start, to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're sitting here tonight thinking, yeah, Sally, I carry that same secret. There's not anybody I can tell you don't understand my family, my friends, my status, my role, my church. I would encourage you to think long and hard about that with God, to take that to God and see if there might be another way for you to walk that out. And to the friend in this room who doesn't even know that your friend is gay, that your friend is trans, that your friend ident identifies as non-binary, and you don't understand all that, and you don't want to have to deal with the pronouns, Ask God what he might want to say to you about loving your neighbor as yourself and what you would want somebody to do for you when something was really important to you. And if you're a staff member or a faculty member or somebody in a position of authority around here, I would encourage you to continue doing what you did today in creating this space and having these conversations and let it not end here. Because, you know, on a university campus, the life cycle is four years, right? And in four years, nobody remembers that this happened. Nobody remembers that we were here and we talked about that. And sometimes I've worked with churches who say, we, well, we had that conversation. We talked about that, you know? We did that once, and nobody remembers it. When something has been so egregiously overlooked at best and really vilified at worst, it takes a lot of these conversations constantly, and we're thinking, oh, my word, we're talking about that again. We did that. We talked about that. We had that. We need to have it again so that nobody leaves here with a degree from Whitworth who believes that they have no place within the body of Christ, that they give up on the idea that they can be a Christ follower. You want everybody who leaves here to be intent on following Jesus and finding other believers with whom they can associate. Woe to you when all people speak well of you which probably doesn't sound like an encouragement, but it is for the following reason. Uh, th that I think there is no way of having this conversation that will not invite challenge. Um, there's no way of having this conversation in which all people speak well of you. Uh, and if you take that as license to never have the conversation, then you may succeed in keeping everyone's favor. Um, but it is a wonderfully Jesus-y thing uh, to step into spaces that are uncomfortable for the sake of uh, creating opportunity for people who most need to know about the love of Jesus to encounter the love of Jesus in meaningful ways. Um, and so if that sounds, if that sounds scary, uh, if that sounds like a gamble, then good, because it is, and do it anyway. Thank you both. We
want to just thank you for, for being here, being here as well on the live stream. Thank you on behalf of the Wayhauser Center, the President's Office, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Campus Ministry. And I want you to know that, that Sally and Greg said, told me earlier that they delight in chatting with students. So, and faculty, staff, anyone who wants to come chat with them afterwards, come on up and ask your questions that didn't get answered. Sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Uh, but really grateful for you taking this time. Also, campus ministry staff and many others here at Whitworth, we'd be delighted to keep this conversation going. Uh, we we uh, just want these things to be a place where we can know Jesus more and bring our whole self to him and trust him with our whole self. So if you want to talk, come grab one of us, campus pastors or GAMIs or uh, other folks on campus, come talk with us. But finally here, will you please uh, join me in thanking God and thanking these two, thanking Sally and Greg for coming here tonight. <laughs> Well, 